Um, so now we've heard from two speakers in regards to the actual issues of air quality, and you may still think, well, surely more river crossings, more dispersal might help this problem. But um, unfortunately, we don't believe that to be the case. We have here John Elliott, an independent transport consultant with over 40 years experience in all aspects of transport planning. John has worked at the GLC, is an expert in trans, um, traffic management and the impact of building new roads. And obviously, as the Nova Silver Town campaign, we would thank him to pay close attention to what John has to inform us. It's <coughs> almost counterintuitive, and it's also quite um, startling. So, John. Thank you. Good evening. Um, First of all, if anybody needs to get in touch with me, the first slide has contact details. So and, uh, if people have queries, do come back before I go home or afterwards. Anyway, what I wanted to cover was <coughs> the schemes and their history. Their history is very, very long indeed. Um, the traffic generation from new roads, which, uh, as has been explained, I've done a lot of work on. But I'm not the only one to have done work on this. There is a, such a body of evidence that shows that new roads, especially in big urban areas, generate phenomenal volumes of traffic. Um, the comment was made that perhaps TfL understands this better than central government because some of the policies coming out to building roads in the rest of the country are even worse. Um, TfL had a case before they went to consultation. I wanted to cover that. What the London Assembly's Traffic Committee said about that consultation, which is quite informative, and the results uh, of the report from TfL on the consultation, which has some quite interesting things. Then the effects of traffic management tolls, etc. Our case, my case, uh, and TfL's case. And you they're very much the same if you sort out the words for them. Anyway, the, the scheme, the Silver Tower scheme, obviously, is coming from the same road, it doubles the capacity across the Thames. I don't know what's going to happen down that road because it's full at the moment. It's regulated by the Blackwell Tunnel. Um, if it has twice the capacity, or twice the volume, perhaps. Um, the Silver Town link, this one, I fought two inquiries, one for Ken Livingston, one against Ken Livingston, because he was in favour of it when it's a Thames Gateway Bridge, but wasn't one because he's done the crossing. Um, it could be a ferry, which I don't think would cause a big problem in the evolution of road, certainly it would, and a case was made that this scheme originally would extract traffic from Blackpool Tunnel and make it work. Um, the London Plan of Roads in 1970, <coughs> Railway 1, including the Blackwell Tunnel and its approaches. Uh, interestingly, I was involved afterwards in the modelled flows on that link of a road in 1968 modelled flows. There 340,000 vehicles a day in a four lane road in each direction wouldn't fit. <laughs> it just wouldn't. Physically possible, impossible. And of course, this other ringway was, when you looked at the detail, is exactly where the Gallion's Reach is now. And that scheme, Gallion's Reach, whatever, whether it's renamed a bit like Sellafield, it, it, it's been there since 1944. In various Anyway, um, when I during the Great Eleven Council, I was told by the politicians there that roads generate traffic. This was a matter of policy. The government said traffic will increase regardless, and that was a matter of policy. Anyway, so I'm trying to be professional, and civil engineers think you build a bypass, it takes traffic away from the area, so it, it's good to build bypasses. So I had this difficult situation, and politicians were my masters, but I wanted to keep a bit of professional. So, I found all these bits of roads to be built while GLC had the data. That section in 25, that had been built, that had been built. The M1 extension was circular road, 
the M3 and A316, Westway, just off the end of Maryland Road, Blackwall Tunnel and the Northern Tunnel approaches, and near Malone. Looked at all of those, and I had really good traffic data between 66 and 86 on all those schemes. So, sizable schemes. So, what actually happened? I'll just take a couple of these. That's what happened with Westway. This was the Westway Corridor, not just the road. The other the Bayswater Road was just as full five years afterwards as it was before. But the whole corridor, the traffic levels had doubled. This is just on the fringe of central London. Two sort of controls, they're not ideal controls, the Brompton Road corridor, which was uh, Brompton Road, Old Brompton Road, Fulham Road, and the Finchley Road corridor, which is Finchley Road, Abbey Road, St John's Wood Road. So you can see what happened in other corridors where there was less road improvements. And you can see a fairly little change, but even interestingly, there was a change in this period. And both those roads, the Swiss Cottage Generator was built, and the Earl's Court one-way system was changed in that. So even there, generated traffic. So the nearest you could get to a control. That's the reference to my report, which we republish in a, in a um, transport magazine. So anybody who refers to that, and it's a public document that you can get on. It was hushed up when the GLC left. Um, Blackpool Tunnel, this is peak traffic, doubled within, this is before and after study, which I think were about six months apart. The total flow on Blackpool Tunnel doubled. Where did it come from? Nowhere really. It's all new. Unless there are a lot of amphibious vehicles <laughs> before, but it's new traffic. That's peak. Uh, I think for Blackwell Tunnel, it was about three years before the all day doubles, or it was five years with Westwood. But it was only about three years. So, a really uh, enormous increase. Going on to the TfL reasons that they gave for the scheme in the consultation document. More enterprises will help our city grow. They will claim that claims are all about reducing road congestion, improving reliability and opportunity to enhance the environment and access to pedestrians and cyclists. Very slight paraphrase of what they said, but you can go back to the document as roughly what they said. London has grown very substantially last 20 years, population has increased by about 2 million, I think. Um, anyway, uh, traffic volumes, even in outer London, are now going down. Rather big increase in population, so do we need more roads to cover less traffic? <coughs> um, more and large roads increase traffic and increase congestion elsewhere and don't normally help pedestrians and cyclists. So. I don't know how they use that in the consultation. The second one is, was improving public transport, and here they describe extensive improvements to public transport in the region, but states that not every journey, but stated that not every journey can be made by public transport. Well, yeah, we can't. And I, in East London, a lot has been done for public transport. Similarly, a lot has been spent on roads. The A13 has been upgraded, the route along the, the south bank through Thamesmead and all that's been upgraded. Um, the highway has been built. There's a lot of road space that's been added, mainly in a range of direction. Um, what's the real evidence of more capacity is needed and helpful at either that or sort of that or Gavin's region? Need. Existing roads are still available. They presently carry a number of commuters, uh, some of which will transfer with continuing improvements to public transport. And if people transfer, there's more space for essential traffic. And that was their slide to sort of say, well, the network capacity across the top road network capacity has only increased a little bit, but public transport has increased a lot. Well, I can say that's good anywhere as far as I can see. 
The third really case, in somewhat overlapping cases were given in the consultation, the problems we're trying to solve, regular long delays of that tunnel, particularly during peak times. So that is where there's no evidence in solving. Frequent closures of Blackwall Tunnel, the need to replace Woolwich Ferry infrastructure, that was said in 1986 when the Peace River Crossing came up, and the need for additional road connections to support growth. Um, maybe it'd be nice to cross at the Thames more often, do we need to cross it on a big road, and if you, even if you separated London at the Thames, North of the Thames and South of the Thames have probably got better connectivity than anywhere else in the country. <coughs> so <coughs> you might want more, but do we actually need it for those stated reasons? Will additional capacity uh, uh, address these problems? I do not think it will. It's more exactly likely to exacerbate them by generating <coughs> extra road network with delays, congestion, and of course pollution, more traffic in many other places across the whole of East London and across the world. Are there any other real solutions to traffic problems in the East and throughout London? Uh, I would suggest continuing public transport cycle and pedestrian improvements that have been successful. Um, congestion charging the M25 hasn't been tried yet, but there's an awful lot of people who do commute from outside London into London. Do they really need to come in by car? If they left their cars at the at London Boundary, we'd get rid of quite a lot of the traffic. Uh, so park and ride at M25, not totally in favour of park and ride, but still really, preferably, should be on the rail or the bus all the way. But having got to where we are, at least London could be protected with a congestion charge of park and ride. And more local pedestrian, cycle and transport connections across the right east London. There's a big area of sort of Dagenham to Eris. There's a very long length of river there that hasn't got a single crossing, and none of land in the moment. London Assembly response on the consultation. And I think it would be helpful to give that maybe. Views. And they commented uh, they made these three bullet points, and some of them are Therefore, should set out clearly the objective of its proposals, the new river crossing, and their different impacts. And it's quite telling, this was obviously a group that still believed that, or most of them believed, that road improvements would help. And um, it would be important, therefore, to for TfL to define the purpose and differential benefits of a proposal and consideration, <coughs> including the wider range of options beyond the principal proposals of these two road schemes. So, no other proposals. Consultation material on potential schemes should acknowledge a different impact the proposed options could have on local communities in East and South East London. We would like to see more information on delivery implications. We would also welcome evidence of TfL's work to manage demand for road crossings. That was under principle one, first of all, point. Principle two, uh, TfL's consultation <coughs> process must be transparent. The information used to underpin the mayor and TfL's <coughs> should be available for the duration of the consultation process. And the more information TfL provides on the impacts of new crossings, the more legitimate it will make the consultation process. And TfL should learn from the successes and failures of past schemes. And they said the inspector's report from Thames Gateway Bridge, where uh, the inspector was very doubtful about the economic regeneration of Thames Gateway Bridge. And he also commented on that Blackpool Tunnel doubling of floodwaters. So, the summary of report on consultation, this is TfL's comments on that consultation. They highlighted, the comments we received highlighted this use of 
here that I'll need to address in the ongoing across the program. Shame it wasn't addressed before the consultation. Range of opinions for replacing the British Ferry and other than further consultation would be necessary. There were a lot of opinions there. Strong appetite within the public and stakeholders for the TfL to consider crossings for cyclists, pedestrians, and public transport users. Not included in the proposals. And also, last but not least, highlighting potential issues associated with the user charging regime, including how it would work, when it might apply, and who would pay. And uh, it seemed there were an awful lot of people that were strongly against the charging regime. Um, the scheme will not work and is not worth engaging in at all without some sort of charge really, I don't believe. So that's what's the vehicle. So what sort of charging regime do you have? This is where I go back to my 40 years of dealing with these sorts of things. Let's try and break it down. Scenario one, tolls high enough not to increase traffic at all. That would mean diversion of the existing traffic to other crossings, negligible benefit because you wouldn't have any more traffic than you've got at the moment for enormous cost, but still traffic gets to the next congestion point quicker and different places for queuing traffic. None of them will always be queuing traffic, there's always an insatiable demand, even if they're regulated. The same amount of traffic's around, there's a queue somewhere else if it doesn't queue at battle. Scenario two, two, no tolls. And the evidence is that you'll get 100% or thereabouts extra traffic because you've got 100% extra capacity. So what did TfL say about reports on consultation? They go further than just the tolls. It would be necessary to understand the specific traffic impacts of potential new crossing options at Silvertown before we could determine whether any further traffic necessary elsewhere in London, rather than simply the top of the bridge. Really. <laughs> um, the absence of charging, the additional capacity could attract excessive volumes of traffic. Same thing as what I've just said. In the absence of water, and the funding I haven't mentioned, obviously they've got to fund it, and funding is an important reason for the tolls. But then there's no decision to be made. But without some decision, without some ideas of how it would work, the scheme in my book is dead in the water. You shouldn't be consulting on something that can't go away. So that's what I hope I've covered, and obviously open to uh, questions during the project.